Hello, my name is Derek Folds, and this is my story. Oh yeah. Hello, my name is Derek Folds, I come from outer space. The eye which sits before you now was once within a face. My face is not as handsome by people of my kind. The people of your earth to me look like a cast behind. My planet is so different, I let them by mistake. I'm flying in my spaceship truck, I take my future fate. I should have took a left turn, instead I took a right. I counted on to run no space and flew on from the right like a bat. With sleep with the controls, I travelled to the planet Earth unconscious, I suppose. By sleeping through the journey, directions I had lost. I flew to each three sides, but my life is always cost. I collided with the low bridge, my eyes shot out the window. My vessel burned and left behind a graving pile of tinder. We're ruined on this ship landed, no way of getting home. I popped into a jar of stuff and wandered off alone. To stay. I may as well examine bits of earth for no pay. You have so many things here, I want to know the history. So let us all investigate and solve this blooming mystery. Welcome to Tonight We Investigate, the program which investigates things other programs can only dream about investigating. Hello, I'm Derek Folds, and this is Experimental Dave. How do? We will be your hosts for the evening. Tonight on Tonight We Investigate, we investigate tonight the strange and mysterious world of... When you stop to think about it, how many of us have stopped to think about where the pencil actually comes from? Come with me now on a journey into the history of the pencil to find out. You don't see the point? Well, here it is. <laughs> oh, ow! Our journey begins in 1900. One, a two, a three. In 1900, things were much better than they are now. There was no unemployment, and crime just simply wasn't allowed. People used to leave their doors unlocked all night long. In fact, many people used to remove their doors entirely and throw them away, like a piece of rubbish. Like this. <laughs> By July 1900, the first British design pencil appeared on the market. The first British design pencils were made of oak and were six feet long in size. Worldwide oak tree depletion and a 300% increase in the nation's back problems soon followed. Pencils were originally designed for use by ornithologists as directing poles for migrating swans heading south for the winter. Come, come, you. Come on. Migrate, you Migrate little now, buggles. this very instant. Up into the sky. South, please. Oh, blessed things. Ornithologists. Don't talk to me about ornithologists. They come round here with their six-foot pencils, waving them around in the air. Only they're not pencils. They're directing poles, apparently. Directing bloody poles. They're pencils! So anyways, these ornithologists would stand around with their directing poles. Pointing for the bloody swans, which way they should go? Pointing for the bloody swans! Bloody students! 
So there's all these college boys with their degrees and all their fancy talk and laddle all day long in the old, and they're standing around waving a bloody girl pencil around the place for the swans. Turns out they were using the bloody things wrong anyway. Pencil ain't for a bloody swan direction. It's for writing with. You write with it. Come on now. Last. Oh, go. Come I on. say, Charlie, take a look at this. Oh. Ah, 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 ah. As a result of the pencil's newfound writing feature, ornithologists throughout the world left swans to get on with it and find their own way south. From that day forth, swans migrated in every direction except south. Some swans flew east, others west, but the majority flew straight up until they collided with the sun, knocking it off its axis and eventually resulting in the global warming problem we have today. Problem? What problem? I don't see no freaking problem. Global warming. Merry Christmas, you dumb schmuck. Hey, Tony, you want a hot dog? Is that a yes? The British pencil of the 1900s was believed for many years to be the world's first pencil. Britain's claim to have the world's first pencil in 1900 was actually disproved by Howard Carter's successful discovery of King Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922. Howard Carter discovered the body of the mummified boy king had an ancient Egyptian style pencil in his mouth at the time of his burial. Historians now believe that the pencil could have caused Tutankhamun's untimely death. The King Tutankhamun was discovered with a pencil in his mouth. Egyptian pencils were designed with one fatal flaw. They were made with the wood on the inside and lead on the outside. Research shows that King Tut had gone for a fitting inside his sarcophagus, which was a usual weekly procedure for ancient Egyptians. To pass the time, he had taken a coffee time word search book into his coffin with him. While his funeral directors took measurements in preparation for his death, which wasn't scheduled to take place for many years to come, King Tutankhamun probably chewed on his pencil while searching for an elusive word search answer. This resulted in lead poisoning and the king's immediate demise. Pencil designers learned from this sad event to always ensure the lead was placed on the inside of the pencil to avoid any future poisonings. Also, pencil designers noticed that the ancient Egyptian style pencil was much smaller and easier to use than the cumbersome British design of the 1920s. The new Egyptian size pencil could easily be operated by one person without the need of a horse and 20 feet of rope. British designers of the 1920s quickly stoned this idea and incorporated it into the hand sized pencil, still widely used today. So. By the 1920s, we had a hand-sized pencil with wood on its outside and lead on its inside. But there was another problem which pencil engineers had to overcome. Bending. Pencils of the early 1920s were made of wood. And as everybody knows about wood of the 1920s, it was a little less rigid than the wood of today. Trees of this period were commonly bent back and forth on account of dense fog and dodos nesting in their branches. This resulted in more flexible trees and therefore more flexible wood. Wood of this period was ideal for the filling of cushions and pillows. Its soft luxurious feel was envied throughout the whole of Northern Europe. This however caused a problem for pencil engineers. Writing with a bendy pencil was virtually impossible. The thing bent and buckled so much, writing a single letter took upwards of 12 weeks. And even then no one could understand which letter it was supposed to be. What the hell is that? I thought you were doing a letter. What's this? A squiggle? You're useless. 
We needed to come up with a process of unlucification, I like to call it. The wood was simply too bendy. Of course, I would have come up with a solution a lot quicker. If I'm been working with complete imbeciles, like Terry, it all happened like this. I was in the kitchen, a boiling up some eggs, when that idiot Terry came in with my bendy pencil. Come on, eggs, do your thing. Terry, is that my pencil? Have you been in my laboratory again? Give it here. Suddenly, yeah. a savage battle ensued between Terry and myself. With me on the side of good, <laughs> and Terry on the side of evil. Oh! Me wig! Me wig's come up! Oh, Terry! Terry, not me moustache! Oh, no! No, it's not! No! Stop it! Stop it! No! Oh. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, oh, after the police had gone, I discovered that the bendy pencil yeah. had been dropped into the oh. egg pan during the skirmish. Holy mackerel! Mmm, much better. The hot water has made the pencil nice and rigid. The eggs, however, were totally overdone, and I had to send Terry away for medical experiments. Terry! Be a dear and bugger off. By the 1930s, pencils were as commonplace as shopping trolleys in rivers. But suddenly, World War II broke out. Everything seemed rationed. Pencils were among the first casualties. Wood, which was previously used for building pencils, was now required by the war effort to produce millions of self-assembly bedside cabinets. What would happen is Allied troops would drop unassembled bedside cabinets over enemy lines. This would distract the Germans who love to show off their building skills. It says insert pole A into subsection B. Not so fast, Fritzy. Take that! Good show! As a result of the wartime rationing, a family of four was expected to survive on only two pencils each per week. Most people couldn't live on this amount and resorted to visiting black market traders. These black market pencil pushers, as they became known, could demand sky-high prices for a pencil. You can have one pencil, but it'll cost you the lower part of your left leg. Give me a pencil. Whoa. Visiting a pencil pusher was a dangerous affair. Anyone caught in possession of an illegal pencil could face up to five weeks concentrated fountain pen use. A sentence few wanted. Yes, yes. I used pencil pushers throughout the war. We all did. It was the only way of surviving at that time. Unfortunately, I did get caught in possession of an illegal pencil, and uh, my sentence was the full five weeks' use of nothing but fountain pens. I tried to keep this a secret from my friends and family, but the ink kept leaking from the pens onto my hands, revealing my secret shame to the world. The humiliation and embarrassment that this incident has caused has been impossible to overcome. It, it's absolutely impossible. And of course, it wasn't long after this that I killed myself. But I've picked myself up since then. I'm doing all right as it goes. At the end of the war in May 1945, the world rejoiced. Pencil rationing was immediately phased out, and over the next decade, pencils became more popular than ever. Pencil Hour, the popular radio show broadcast from the BBC, became a national favourite, with millions tuning in each week to catch the latest pencil episode. 
That's right, Mr. Harris. Were you also aware that pencil scientists have discovered if you sharpen a pencil after it's become blunt, its lifespan could be increased by 30%? Really? I had just been throwing them away after the first few hours. Thank you, Mr. Grayson. That's quite all right, Mr. Harris. By 1955, however, the world was changing. Denim hula hoops and rock and roll had arrived and had taken the excitement away from pencils for the very first time. Sales of pencils were affected. The industry panicked. The government seemed to want to turn a blind eye to the pencil crisis. Pencil manufacturers decided to take the law into its own hands. Picture the scene. Denim hula hoop sales were up. Tin peach sales remained stable. But pencil sales were down. Our jobs were on the line. As the pencil union leader, it was my job to come up with a list of demands. And this is what I came up with. One. We are not going to be messed about. B. We will not have been about to be messed about with. F. Missing us about will only lead to us missing you about. Six. If anyone starts looking as if they're going to mess us about, then I'm afraid there's going to be a hell of a lot of mess about. Three. We're not going to mess about while someone else starts messing up our messing us about. And finally, A. We have no intention, and I want to make myself perfectly clear on this point, we have no intention of letting anyone about to mess us about messing us about with us. It was that simple. I put these demands to the government at the time, who chose to ignore them. So we went on strike. What do we want? We want pencils. Anything else? No. The Great Pencil Case, as it became known, lasted for two and a half years, during which Britain suffered massive stationary losses. The government became pressurized into doing something before the nation exploded through the lack of pencils. It responded by setting up the Pencil Marketing Board. It was 1957, 58, and the entire pencil industry was on strike. The pencil was seen as an outmoded form of stationery by the ever-important teenage market. If the pencil was to last the rest of the 50s and into the 60s, it needed bringing up to date and modernising. It was the pencil marketing board's job to do just that.
marketing board had become a massive Hooray! success. The great pencil case strike Hooray! ended and pencils were back amongst Hooray! the top selling items in Britain. Ow! The 1960s brought with it a freer attitude towards pencils. Pencils were becoming part of the popular culture and also the subculture of New York's underground scene. And they were also appearing in their own television shows. I'm not a free man. I'm a pencil. Told you. The 1960s brought the Cold War between Russia and America. The rivalries between the two countries were to affect the pencil once again. The competition between the two countries became intolerable. Both the Russians and the Americans turned everything into a race between each other. From who could make the quickest sandwich to who could climb up the stairs the fastest. This inevitably resulted in the space race. They wanted to see which country could put the first pencil into space? The damn fools. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off. <laughs> Over $70 billion was pumped into the pencil space race. The technology developed during this time was later used to put Neil Armstrong on the moon in 1969. Three, two, one, blast off. Houston, I require assistance. Yeah, I'm stuck up a tree. I think we're gonna need a ladder here. Yo, Houston! What the hell's going Hello, on? Houston. Get me out of this goddamn tree. I ain't kidding. Hello? You're Come on, man. Goddamn son of a bitch. Please. Get me up into a tree. Get me the hell down. Oh, yes. We owe a lot to the pencil space race. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't have the Apollo 13 today. I love that movie. And the Goonies. The 1970s arrived with all of its hilarious flares and spangles. But an incident in an American school was to lead to a major redesign for the pencil. Yeah, I remember the incident with the American school kid. He injures himself with a pencil and sues the entire pencil industry. It nearly crippled us. The way I see it, if you can't operate a pencil correctly, you shouldn't be allowed to own one. Capiche? Was an off after kid jabbed himself in the nose with it. Stupid kid. Hey, Tony, want a cigar? <laughs> Is that a yes? After the American nose jabbing incident court case, 
The pencil industry had to make pencils safer to use so that anybody could operate one without the risk of nose damage. It came up with a piece of protective cushioning material which was attached to the end of the pencil. It acted as a buffer twixt pencil and nose. The Pencil Marketing Board commissioned short films to educate the public to this new safety feature. Kids, what do you think you're doing? We're just taking our pencils out to see a basic realness concert in the town hall. You must be out of your tiny minds. Your pencils are all unprotected. Now what would happen if you accidentally jabbed yourself in the nose with one? Eh? I expected it hurt somewhat. That's right. Here. Try these. <coughs> they must be crackers. Remember, always use pencils with these new protection buffers on them. Because <laughs> I don't want to see any more of your nose than I have to. So remember, belt up. Put a rubber on the end of it. All right? Great. The 1980s and 1990s saw new designs of pencils to suit the modern user. The mobile pencil, the environmentally safe unleaded pencil, and after an incident in America when a school kid accidentally jabbed himself in his foot, the ultra safe pencil. And so there we are, up to date. But what does the future hold for the pencil? I predict that the pencil will become longer and shorter, edible for long exam use, and fitted with an ink reservoir for unerasable writing. But until that day comes, let's recap. The only way I know how, by singing. Hit it! In a hundred British pencils were so big they break your spine. Ornithologists directing swans was just a waste of time. The instructions for the pencil were so simple and so strict, causing swans flight to the heavens, bringing change to the climate. In ancient Egypt, old man Carter found his way into the tomb. The boy king's love of word search parchments caused doom in the catacomb. King cut June on his royal pencil. The lad caused a regal disaster. He promptly died and never would win the top prize ghetto blaster. In 1920, smaller pencils found their way into the world. The brother Dodo and the dense fog bent those threes into a curl. Bendy pencils were the outcome. They bent so much that they would not write. Pencil experts pulled those babies up and then they had a fight. By 1955, rock and roll arrived, the pencil sales had began to plummet. The whole industry went on strike to see if the government would do summit. Do the pencil found, love of lead abound, the world again began to hawk. Check his celebrity was the biggest in history till he was eaten by a shark. The pencil space race fought appearance in court for the nose-jabbing incident. 
Alvin Stardust warned the British children yawn Roberts became a president No need for diamond ring or jingling dang ding No matter what you people say That bit of pointy wood has made the world more good The pencil probably here to stay Pencils well and truly investigated, and I believe the information to be at least 30% accurate. Let's go over live now to Experimental Dave to find out what we're investigating next week. Welcome to this, the second tonight we investigate draw where subjects are chosen at random by a glorified washing machine. As we can see, Dave is loading his balls into the subjectometer. Experimental Dave, will you start the fans, please? Good luck, everybody. As the tension mounts on this second draw, remember, there are over 3,000 possible subjects available for selection. Here comes the ball now. It's number 38. And Experimental Dave is now checking the number against the list of subjects. 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 38. Here we go. Pencils? Dave! You're not supposed to put the balls back once you've taken them out? Idiot. Until next time. Goodbye.